Hey everyone, I'm Jason, and this is your commentary on Matthew chapter 20. This chapter talks about the cost of being a servant. It's broken down into four sections. The first part, we see the workers in the field and how God gives them their reward. The second part, Jesus tells the disciples for a third time that he's going to die. The third part, a mother approaches Jesus, requesting that her two sons be honored above everyone else. In the last section, we see two blind men who call out for Jesus to heal them. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who owned land. He went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to give them the usual pay for a day's work. Then he sent them into his vineyard. About nine o'clock in the morning, he went out again. He saw others standing in the market doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard. I'll pay you what is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and at three o'clock and did the same thing. About five o'clock, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard spoke to the person who was in charge of the workers. He said, call the workers and give them their pay. Begin with the last ones I hired, then go on to the first ones. The workers who were hired about five o'clock came. Each received the usual day's pay. So when those who were hired first came, they expected to receive more. But each of them also received the usual day's pay. When they received it, they began to complain about the owner. These people who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. You have paid them the same as us. We have done most of the work and have been in the hot sun all day. The owner answered one of them, Friend, he said, I'm being fair to you. Didn't you agree to work for the usual day's pay? Take your money and go. I want to give the one I hired last the same pay I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Do you feel cheated? because I gave so freely to the others? So those who are last will be first, and those who are first will be last. It's only human nature that if we do more work, we would expect to get paid more. But the owner is completely fair. He started from the beginning saying, if you work in my field, I will pay you a usual day's wages. And they agreed upon it. So they are getting exactly what they agreed upon. The reason why they're upset is because they're comparing themselves to these other workers. They don't realize that the owner owns all the money and he can choose to give the money to whomever he wants. The reward is God's to give as he sees fit for his believers. It may not seem fair, which is actually a good thing. Uh, this life isn't a competition. We don't want to start comparing ourselves with other believers. Sure, when we compare ourselves to some, we may think that we deserve more, but then when we compare ourselves to others, then we don't stand a chance. It's not a competition, and the rewards of heaven and eternal life have nothing to do with our own actions. The positive news for the workers who came at the five o'clock hour, it means that it's never too late for us to approach God either. Never give up on anyone, because you never know when God may call them as well. Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took his 12 disciples to one side to talk to them. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will sentence him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. The people will make fun of him and whip him. They will nail him to a cross. On the third day, he will rise from the dead. Now, Jesus is being extremely specific uh, and exactly what's going to happen to him. It would be hard pressed for any of us to know how we're going to die or when we're going to die. But Jesus knew exactly what was going on. And this is actually the third time now that he's mentioning it to his disciples to prepare them for what is about to happen. It's not even like, oh, you're going to get hit by a car or going to, something, an accident's going to occur. When he says that they're going to nail him to a cross, 
the cross was one of the worst forms of punishment. Um, that's actually where we get the word excruciating from. It's, it's literally out of the cross because it was that painful and was only reserved for the worst of the worst. It was also a Roman form of punishment. The Jews didn't have the ability to do that. So for him to know exactly what was going to happen, and that would be something so far-fetched that there would not be any way for someone to guess that this was going to happen. This shows us that it wasn't an accident. Um, it, it didn't catch him by surprise and then, oh, he was just going around doing ministry as a good teacher would, and then all of a sudden he happens to be crucified. This shows us that this was part of his plan from the beginning, that this is the purpose for why Jesus is here. This is in our chapter of what it means to be a servant. It means that Jesus knew the cost beforehand, and he still chose to do it for us anyway. The mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus. Her sons came with her. Getting on her knees, she asked a favor of him. What do you want? Jesus asked. She said, Promise me that one of my two sons may sit at your right hand in your kingdom. Promise that the other may sit at your left hand. Now, the right and left hand of the king is the highest honor that you can have to sit at one of the two sides of him. And that's what she's asking here of Jesus. You don't know what you're asking for, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup of suffering I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will certainly drink from my cup, but it is not for me to say who will sit at my right or left hand. These places belong to those my father has prepared them for. The other ten disciples heard about this. They became angry at the two brothers. Jesus called them together. He said, You know about the rulers of the Gentiles. They hold power over their people. Their high officials order them around. Don't be like that. Instead, Anyone who wants to be important among you must be your servant, and anyone who wants to be first must be your slave. Be like the Son of Man. He did not come to be served. Instead, he came to serve others. He came to give his life as the price for setting many people free. This is a sharp contrast to how the world views honor. We typically honor the celebrities. We honor the people who are rich and powerful and we think that they're the ones who have the honor. And Jesus is turning it around, saying, if these people, James and John, really want to be in a position of honor, they're going to have to suffer. They're going to have to be a servant, and they're going to have to be a slave. This is actually sandwiched right between the other passages, where Jesus shows us like he is going to pay the ultimate price. He is the perfect servant. And then just following after that, they're asking for honor. That's why Jesus says that they're going to suffer as well, if that's what they want. Whenever it comes to our desire to be honored in relationship to the kingdom of heaven, don't think you could do it by your great deeds or because you're charismatic or because of any gift that you may possess. The only way to truly be honored in the kingdom of heaven is to let go of your ego completely humble yourself and sacrifice for other people. Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho. A large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the side of the road. They heard that Jesus was going by, so they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd commanded them to stop. They told them to be quiet, but the two men shouted even louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called out to them. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Lord, they answered. We want to be able to see. Jesus felt deep concern for them. He touched their eyes. Right away they could see, and they followed him. These two blind men are so desperate for God's mercy that they're calling out for Jesus. I think it's important for us to realize they're calling him Lord. We don't have an exact translation, but the closest thing that we have, it, Lord is boss. You're admitting that the other person is in charge. 
and that you are obligated to obey them. So they're not calling him as savior, which he definitely is, and he saves them and gives them the ability to see, but they're calling him Lord, which is why it says that as soon as they could see, they followed him. The two are inseparable. We cannot call Jesus our savior if we're not willing to call him our Lord as well. Now, these last few chapters have shown us that um, man's focus is kind of on our own honor. Yet the only way to receive honor is by humbling ourselves, uh, becoming a servant to others. Jesus could have came as a king and rightfully demanded our obedience. But instead, he came as a poor servant to show us by example the greatest act of submission. We are not asked to submit to an indifferent God. It should be easier for us to submit to someone that we know has already sacrificed so much for us. So this week, take time, remember whatever God is asking you to do, or whatever he's asking you to give up. He himself has already sacrificed so much more for us than he's asking of us to sacrifice for him and for others. Well, that's it for Matthew chapter 20. Uh, if you've been blessed by these videos, uh, please consider joining us as a ministry partner. The link is in the description down below. Thank you so much for joining me, and I'll see you guys next time.